A note to the listeners, episode 54 contains some very brief, explicit language. Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. Shingle Spit Road by Megan Hakkinen. There are two types of people, those who don't mention their past and those who won't shut up about it. My father's brother Vincent fell in with the first, so I'll just tell you what I know. Uncle Vincent, never Vince, traded college for the army and shipped out at 21 on peacekeeping missions in Croatia, Bosnia, and Herzegovina. It was hard on him, my father said. After a brief stint hitching through Argentina, Uncle Vincent returned to his homeland. With the commercial vehicle license he earned in the military, Uncle became a school bus driver on Hornby Island, British Columbia, about as far as you could get from anywhere. Every summer vacation, we drive up for Labor Day weekend. Uncle Vincent's blue trim trailer, parked on an overgrown quarter acre off Shingle Spit Road, felt cramped and dingy. The countertops and cupboards stained a sad, sallow yellow. A single shelf of books lined the dim, wood-paneled hallway. I once witnessed Mother half-tuck an envelope under one of the owl-shaped bookends. Five hundred-dollar bills. Vincent's marriage collapsed, said my father. It was a warning. We were on the ferry to Hornby Island, leaning against the upper deck guardrail with the sun on our backs, waiting for the horn to sound. I think my father, in his reserved way, was trying to remind me to behave myself. Uncle Vincent didn't cope well with additional sources of stress, but I took the statement as evidence of how fragile and hinging on disintegration everything was. There were no genuine fail-safes, all of us just a guardrail away from toppling headfirst into the roaring blue abyss. A classmate had recently introduced me to the activist magazine Adbusters, and I had begun to view the world a shade or two darker than I used to. Those foaming whirlpools of big pharma, corporation, and greed now visible just below the surface. I wondered if finances had factored into Uncle Vincent's divorce. My older cousins, Luce and Amy, named by their Quebecois mother, visited intermittently, and even as teenagers they slept in bunk beds. We played Scrabble together, Uncle Vincent the arbiter of recurrent disputes. I remember how Luce and Amy would smirk after he penalized me. It was always me for slipping in bogus words. Uncle got by, even in the dry season, on a well out back. He took military showers and flushed the toilet with a red plastic pail. I remember clogging it once, real bad. Panicked, I poured down another pail, while Uncle bellowed at the door, Amelia, we're having a water shortage in case you didn't know. My turds swirled round in circles like shameful carousel horses until the toilet bowl finally drained. One visit, just after I'd aced my ninth grade exams, we were lolling round the picnic table beneath two ancient maples, their leaves a bold, bright green, and big as your face. The adults drank Pinot Grigio that my mother had brought, and chatted, only half listening, about the lesser-off folks on the island. "'It's because of capitalism,' I cut in. "'Communist countries like Cuba, you don't know about communism,' Uncle interrupted from across the table. "'You don't know a thing.' The skin under his stubbly beard burned the same rouge that his ex-wife painted her lips. His eyes, cold, locked onto mine like an enemy target. What they teach you in school, well, what do they teach you? My parents, where were they? The two of them must have been present, but my memory of this moment is like a spotlight in the night sky. Only Uncle Vincent and I are illuminated. I swallowed. We've got to look out for each other. Look out for- Listen. Uncle interrupted. You figure out what's what. His voice cut like a rusty axe that's kept its edge. And don't ever let no one talk bullshit to you. Don't trust me here on the details. My parents must have rematerialized. Maybe my father topped up their glasses while I sulked away. I remember lying back in Luce's top bunk, ceiling close overhead, reading Archie comics. With every page I turned, the contents of the previous faded, so I had to flip back in order to catch the punchline. Back and forth. Again. Again. But I couldn't grasp a word of it.
The Opening by Edith Gallagher Boyd We were proud to be cynics, Walter and I. It made the list of things we bantered about at parties, smug and sure-footed in our delivery. No taking out a loan to pay the vet in our family, Walter would say, especially after a few cognacs. His comments often followed my boast of never bringing the kids to Disney. We were different, not given to maudlin fawning over animals, or their mascots. I remember the slight shift in our dogma. One of our landscapers, never charmed by my Spanish, pointing, Mira, senora. I scraped my shin in the bushes in front of Walter's office to see what delighted the somber guy. Draped across her young, I saw a black feral cat. She hissed at us, and we backed away. Hector, his name sewn into his pocket, averted his eyes and walked to his truck. I went indoors to tell Walter, and noticed he was on his business line. There was talk of an opening at corporate in Naperville. Candace, dinner at the Drake. Shopping the Miracle Mile. You'll love it. Our kids were in college, and my family was in Chicago, so I let myself warm to the idea. When his call was finished, I grabbed his hand and led him outside to see our visitors. He pulled me close and said, She's like you, with Lucas, that time we went to New York. Keeping a respectful distance, we lingered, enjoying the scene. When is the last time Walter hugged me like that, I thought, grateful for the closeness. I often reminded myself that the luxuries we enjoyed put a strain on him, showing in the lines around his eyes. I wish you all good lives, he said solemnly. In the months that followed, the cats scattered, except for one. We learned words like tabby, shyly asking friends we may have insulted before. We eased into feeding her, learning her preference for wet food over dry. She waited for the sound of our car the evenings we went out, looking expectant, like our Ellen at two years old, waiting for a treat. When my husband broke free from work before sundown, we would relax on the back porch hoping for a visitor. Like her mother, the cat was taut and wary, never getting close. But she was close enough to bring out of us long-buried memories of our kids when they were one hug away. And we voiced present concerns as twilight slanted shadows across the lawn. Do you trust that guy Ellen is seeing, Walter asked, which I left unanswered. During one of these feline visits, we made the decision for Walter to accept the promotion. The week before the move, we recruited many of our neighbors to feed the cat. I called before showing up with a box of shredded fare, her favorite. The night before the move, Walter joined me. We hadn't bothered to befriend any of them until it was time to go. Be careful when you back out, Walter told a teenager on our circle. She doesn't go for dry food, I told another neighbor who reluctantly accepted the food I offered. The car carrier, which picked up my car, screeched to a halt on our street. That will scare her, I thought, unable to let go. Moving day arrived. I had fixed us a cooler of goodies for the long drive. No car carrier for Walter's Audi. As we pulled out, he reached into the back seat to grab a bottle of water, and I noticed his eyes scanning the circle. I couldn't, but I was grateful that our reins had been slackened. During our first business dinner... Walter's boss made clumsy attempts to welcome us. Guess you'll miss the Jags. We will. But my wife Candace is a Bears fan, Walter said, taking my hand. A tiny woman with wide-set eyes and a kind face said, What do you miss the most? Walter and I smiled at each other. He looked as boyish to me as he did when our coffee table was a cardboard box. I shook my head slightly, trying to transmit the tuition still to be paid the rules of the game to be played. We're excited to be here, looking forward, not back. The tremor in our world was not yet an earthquake, but it was a start. Hello there! Welcome to No Extra Words, the Flash Fiction Podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dersh. I'm your producer and editor. The tremor that may become the earthquake is what we're looking at today, perfectly described in the last line of the opening, which you just heard. Will it become something that rocks our world and changes it, or will it stay buried deep underground? 
Shingle Spit Road, which kicked us off. I hope my Canadian pronunciations weren't completely butchering. Um, but I think we've all had that moment where you're a teenager and you suddenly know everything and then you get smashed against the rocks of reality and find out that perhaps you don't. Then you heard the opening. We're going to end on a lighter note. Coming up is a gorgeous piece of 90 word micro fiction, Jen McConnell's Not Dog People. And then making her third appearance on the show, our first three time contributor, Sally Stevens, rounds us out reading Jasper in her own lovely voice. Not Dog People and Jasper are both about how we sort and organize the people and things and how we experience them as our world change and shifts underneath us. They're a ton of fun just to lighten us up. It is summer. As you're listening to this, I'm on vacation, but still bringing you fiction and blog posts, all that stuff over at noextrawords.wordpress.com. You've got another episode coming in two weeks. I will see you then. But in the meantime, you've got two short stories coming your way. Enjoy. Not Dog People by Jen McConnell. There are dog people, and then there are people who are not dog people. Some of those people are cat people, but those people don't matter. It's the people who are not cat people and not dog people that I don't understand. Like people who don't like dessert. When the aliens come down or the robots take over, they will look at the not dog people and not dessert liking people and say, ah, you are one of us, and the rest of us? We'll be screwed. Jasper. Just after Jasper turned seven, he began swallowing objects, things he found and put in his mouth. At first, it was just small, plastic, nondescript items. The prize that came in the cereal box, the cap to the milk bottle. There was not any particular logic to his choices, for he was very young and unschooled in the ways of the world. His mother wondered what had happened to these things, but since they were not particularly valuable, it was of little concern. Then one day, he swallowed three pennies he found on the coffee table, and later that morning, he swallowed a clothespin and the bus token he was supposed to use on the number 10 bus to Jefferson Elementary School. After walking the three miles to school that morning for lack of the bus token, carrying a heavy book bag, he realized there was wisdom in not swallowing things he might need to cough up later. He picked up several paper clips from the teacher's desk, sucked on them till recess, then bolted them down on the way to the soccer field. When the bell rang to end recess, he picked up two small acorns that fell from the oak tree just outside the classroom and stuffed them into his mouth. As Jasper grew a bit older, he came to understand and appreciate the more sophisticated world around him. By fourth grade, he was tearing ads out of the yellow pages for places he wanted to visit— Dale's Roller Rink, Big Boy Donut Shop, Frosty Freeze, wadding them up and gulping them down. Then one day he opened the encyclopedia and found pictures of a tropical island called Kauai. He ripped out the picture and swallowed three palm trees and a hula girl. A delightful sense of calm and satisfaction swept over him. His mother began to worry when Jasper wouldn't come downstairs for dinner He would simply holler down from the top of the stairs, I'm not hungry, Ma. I just ate the Eiffel Tower and Grand Central Station. She finally coaxed him to the dining table by insisting he have some soup to wash them down with. The source of available material in the world was astonishing to Jasper. By the time he was in junior high school, he had devoured all of Manhattan from 38th and Lexington up to 80th and Park. He had eaten the Metropolitan Art Museum and Central Park Zoo. He'd gotten a tiger toe stuck between two of his molars, but he managed to remove it by flossing with the crowd control rope from St. Patrick's Cathedral. His mother would ask him each day when he came home from school, What did you eat today, dear? And he would rattle off, At snack time, I ate the Mississippi Delta, and for lunch I had the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Or, Oh, I wasn't very hungry today. 
I just had a piece of Antarctica and three polar bears. His mother smiled. He was learning to absorb the world in a most unique way. She was very proud. She took Jasper's picture from the mantel and gazed at it lovingly for a moment. Then she quietly slipped the photograph out of its frame and ate it. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information on today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. The best support you can give the show is to recommend us to your family and friends. See you next time.